Hi, everybody. Um, I believe we have started the um, How to Tap the Potential of Startups from India session. And in today's session, we'll be discussing the startup uh, environment in India. And as a representative from the Zero Project, um, just to give you a bit of a background, over the next couple of years, it's the Zero Project's um, personal interest to have a, big more rep sorry, a bit more representation um, from the Asian region. And with us today, we have um, the host, we have Georg Shin, we have a panelist, Chris Patno, who has been on so many panel sessions already. Um, and online, we have uh, Mira Shinoy, as well as two, of our, um, two other panelists from Social Alpha, we have Ankita Shirodaria, and from the ONI network, Charu Chada. So without further ado, because we only have an hour, I will hand it off to Georg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumita. It's a big pleasure to be here with you. Um, the chair of this session um, is online today. Uh, her name is Mira Chenoy, and you will meet her in a second. I will support her to co-moderate the session. Um, we have three great panelists here today, um, and we will have, I think, a very exciting insights and discussions about the startup scene uh, of impact entrepreneurship in India. So uh, I'm Georg, I'm male, 180, light skin, early 40s. Um, and I'm working for Ashoka. I've done nothing else in the last 20 years than being a social entrepreneur or then supporting social entrepreneurs around the world. And I had the pleasure six years back to develop with the Zero Project team the impact transfer program. So I'm happy to be part of this today. And I hand over to Mira online to give us a context of where we are heading with our discussion today. Thank you, Sumita. <laughs> Thank you, George. So let me just set the context as a chair of the session. Uh, startups from India have raised almost $42 billion in 2021, up from the $11.5 billion in the previous year. Um, India also says that they have the largest number of unicorns, that means those with the $1 billion valuation. Uh, on the other hand, we know that there's such a large population of persons with disability in India, 60 to 70 million is the number quoted by the World Bank and WHO. There are enough studies and examples to show us that with these startups, with science and technology, uh, there are several innovations which make both accessible products and tools, and these help uh, persons with disability to live comfortably, to travel, to be educated, and to be employable, which is extremely important. In our own Youth for Jobs College Connect program, where we work with colleges and universities and the educated persons with dis disabilities, uh, we do several things. Of course, we have a very active program to make the educators disabled friendly. Uh, we have a training program in IT and banking for the youth, and then we place them in jobs. But we also showcase assistive technologies and other products because we find both the educators, the companies, and the youth themselves uh, know very little about these assistive technologies and the products. I think there's no debate at all that every person with disability deserves the joy of an independent, empowered, and fulfilled life made accessible. So I'm really happy to have with me virtually in this session uh, two, two people from India, Ankita and Charu, and virtually Christopher and George. Together, I think in this session, we will explore questions like what are the barriers for which startups can work on solutions? How do they overcome some of the challenges of a fragmented market? Are there startups which have good valuations and have gone global, which can inspire others? What's the kind of ecosphere which is there and which needs to be there? In the session just before, Michael and I had a fireside chat with Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who's up one of the, our policy makers, and he was saying what a wonderful um, act we have and the kind of advances we've made 
in really sowing the seeds of a very, very conducive startup atmosphere in India. So having said this, George, let me leave you to moderate the discussion between the three. Um, then we'll do question and answers. At the end of it, if there's time, I'll wrap the session up. Over to you, George. Uh, thank you, Mira. I think um, we wanted to start with giving the chance for each of the panelists yeah. to introduce yeah. themselves and to kind of share where they come from and their perspective um, and the richness of the work that they are doing. Each of them comes really with a vast background and I was fascinated when I read the stories oh. and the work uh, that the three of them are doing. So um, why don't we start with um, Ankita from Social Alpha in India to set the stage um, with around five minutes of sharing uh, who you are and your work and your, pers your initial perspective. Sure. Thank you, Gio. Uh, so I'm Ankita. Thank you, everyone, for a very warm welcome. I look forward to... Uh, to just uh, being here and chatting with this esteemed panel. Uh, I lead the assistive technology team at Social Alpha. Uh, Social Alpha is a multi-stage innovation curation platform. Uh, we also invest in uh, startups. We've, uh, we believe that social entrepreneurship and market creating innovations are way to go to address any kind of market failures. Uh, we've been one of the first investors, uh, actively been investing in the assistive technology space since the past four years in India. Till now, uh, we've evaluated over 600 startups in this space. We've, we've invested in more than 40. Uh, our idea is that can we handhold assistive technology startups right from the idea stage handhold them right to, you know, when they're launched in the market, understand, help them create their first uh, initial adopters, create their first tribe, and then can we help them scale up. Overall, uh, we have a network of mentors who make this possible. We work with academics such as IIT Delhi, government organizations such as BIRAC, ICMR. Uh, we also work with multilateral organizations in India such as WHO, um, uh, the World Bank, etc. Uh, really, really uh, uh, exciting space to be in. We've seen our startups. Uh, one of our startups called Stamurai is already present in more than 130 countries. Uh, some of our startups have crossed their 50,000 users. Uh, so I think we're just getting started uh, and lots of exciting work ahead. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you so much, Ankita, for starting us up uh, and for giving us an initial insight uh, into the work that you were doing. I would love to ask now um, Charu from the Omidya Network in India um, to give your contribution and to start. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for having me here. I think it's uh, so. I think before I just talk about uh, our work, I think. One of the things when Mira had initially approached us, I had said this is more than anything else an opportunity for us to learn, uh, because forums like these are just so limited. And um, as you know, as compared to Ankita, where Social Alpha has been doing many things in this space, uh, we are almost starting our journey, um, and therefore the forum is really for us uh, a great way to shape uh, our thinking and our strategy ahead. Uh, with that, I think a little bit about Omidya and how we function in India. Uh, uh, Omidya, uh, we'd like to say we are a dual checkbook investor, which uh, essentially means that we, we invest across a continuum from very pure grants to all the way to venture funds that uh, working as a venture fund and kind of funding in startups. Uh, what this kind of framework allows us to do is to uh, work with a, a number of stakeholders from you know government institutions, nonprofits, uh, and bring their collective knowledge to uh, to the startup ecosystem. That uh, we work across sectors uh, from health, agri, financial inclusion, urban governance, uh, property rights, uh, digital society, uh, and the and in in some ways we are are thinking about. Uh, about inclusion from from almost as a horizontal, which is that 
as much as assistive technologies are important and critical, how do we ensure that the next uh, education app a, is essentially inclusive enough uh, that it's thinking about uh, users not just uh, who are able in all ways, but kind of looking at differently able users as well. Uh, and that's that's really the lens that we're really trying to bring in. Uh, that the the, the the next unicorn truly represents all of its user base, uh, and that I, I think is the thinking that we really we are trying to learn in. I think the other really important uh, aspect for us as you know participating here is. Uh, uh, as much as we see a lot of activity in space, and I think Social Alpha has probably the maximum number of organizations, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to actually identify some of these startups where they are. And forums like these uh, for investors, I think both Social Alpha and Omid, there are great ways to kind of put this out as a message and saying this is an area of interest for us and we'd love to hear more from organizations that are working here. Um, I think with that, uh, uh, that's all. I think will be a good start to what Amida is doing here, and then we'll take more questions. Thank you so much, Charu. Um, and I think it's um, it's it's a really special panel because on this panel we actually don't have startups themselves, but we have the supporting ecosystem and the collaborative ecosystem represented um, for impact entrepreneurs. Mira is the exception and it's really great to have you to give us um, you know first-hand insights but you also have a long-standing career in different agencies across sectors so I think that's a very will be a very interesting discussion um, together from a kind of supporting and collaborative perspective on how we can advance together the ecosystem for startups so thank you Charu for your contribution and I would like to ask now Christopher um, to give your initial input, and that's, I think, also exciting to have you here from a perspective of not being what, in my terms, I would call a traditional um, ecosystem actor for impact entrepreneurship, like the Omidya Network or like Social Alpha that have it in their mission to support social entrepreneurs, but you are actually a traditional actor that is going into the space and is part of the space um, it's around the topic of building new types of partnerships and co-creations with large corporations. And I myself, I'm an enthusiastically read some years ago the book of Eric Schmidt, Google. Um, and there is a lot to learn from the corporate sector also for um, the supporting ecosystem of social entrepreneurship, how you can set up internal processes, external processes to start co-creation. So I'm happy to hand over to you now, Christopher, to give us your unique perspective from a large corporations, how you collaborate with impact entrepreneurship and what startups mean to you. Hello, my name is Christopher. Um, again, on the panel, I guess, um, a white male, well-earned gray hair with 30 years experience in the industry. Um, I'm here representing the Google Accessibility team. I lead accessibility for EMEA accessibility and disability inclusion for EMEA. So my regions are Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and we have a deep work, we have a deep passion in terms of engagement in terms of India, so it's, it's sort of EMEA plus. Um, at this time, we are trying to understand what disability means at a Google-style level. What is disability in Africa? What is disability in, in India? Because if you, don't, if you don't ask the right questions, you're never gonna be able to solve the right problems. So we're right now at the point of trying to understand what disability means, say, in, in, in Kinshasa, or say, in, in, in New Delhi, because the technology that we build, the platforms that we build in California, won't work the way you would expect in, 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 in these places where you have different kinds of powerful phones. You don't have ready access towards the internet, the cloud. You, don't, you need to be more careful in terms of power consumption because there's also not as, as much ready access towards power. So having a deep understanding of these kinds of problems allows us to, to retrofit and refactor the work that we have. So I'm coming at this from a perspective of how can Google's products be better to support the, the end users. But also what's, mo what's more important, because a company like Google will never create everything for everyone, how can we empower these startups in, the, in, these, different, in these different countries so they can sell or serve themselves. So the other half of the question is, what, what technologies of Google needs to be redone, refactored, to, to meet the needs of the people, of the community in these countries, and we want to lean and partner with the startups to get that answer, so we know how to make these changes, so they can be more success successful. 
Because I think that's the, the answer to scale, is sort of crowdsourcing the ambition in terms of having us empower these companies to be wildly successful. The, there's a really interesting company in, in India called Transcribe Glass, and this is sort of where I got the idea of this. Um, it started by this 20-year-old this kid named Madhav, and he had this idea of creating a Google Glass style um, piece that it gets on top, that's attached to, your, to one's glasses. And it, it, he, he found this idea when he was 18, and he wanted to build something that, that was for 50 US dollars, that provides real-time captioning for people who are, who are deaf or hard of hearing. Google would never build something like this for the Indian market for 50, for 50 US dollars, but he can, he knows how to do this, or he's trying to, and he wants to use our technologies. So for me, this is that spark, that, that idea that Google can empower startups to make the world better, because only by doing this, these, these things together can we actually solve those problems. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Christopher, and that was uh, really a great example um, of how such a collaboration can ignite and start. Um, I would like now to start with a couple of questions to the panelists, um, and um, I would even ask the panelists if they would have interesting you know, perspectives or questions to share with the other panelists to just jump in, uh, so we make it a bit more participatory, and Mira, of course, yourself as well, and uh, we will then turn uh, to the audience, so please start up getting your questions right um, and whatever you would like to ask and bring it forward um, when the time is there. So I would like to start um, with um, asking Ankita or asking a first question to all of us, uh, specifically to um, Ankita and Charu who are working as an ecosystem actor. Um, where you know, you, you come from the wider space of supporting startups, um, and you mentioned some of the sectors where you are in, and you, Charu, you mentioned that inclusion is a new field which you're exploring. So I would really love to hear from your perspective, where do you see the biggest potential uh, for startups and impact entrepreneurs uh, to contribute uh, to the disability movement? and to inclusion as such. So what would be sectors or issues, challenges out there where impact entrepreneurs and startups would be prime positioned to tackle them? Um, and um, what your perspective is on how you could support them uh, or what your plan is to adopt inclusion and disability into your core business. Uh, so let's start maybe with Ankita and, and get your perspective. Sure. Uh, I think in our experience, what we found is uh, the biggest challenge uh, uh, for anybody who is trying to innovate in this space is access to users and the right feedback while creating the product. Or in some case, like while you're starting an organization, uh, disability or inclusion is often uh, often comes as an afterthought, uh, which makes it very difficult for somebody to create the right product or the service. Um, the second one that uh, we've encountered is the whole affordability and versus, uh, you know, uh, disability seen as a philanthropy topic. So, so to say, uh, of course, we understand that uh, disabled persons are uh, not likely to afford the assistive technology uh, which is available in the market. But at the same time, uh, if assistive technology is only distributed by philanthropists or by the government for free, uh, we are actually not encouraging innovators to come in this space, innovate for them. And in some sense, then it just becomes that the cheapest product, which is often not the great quality, that gets distributed. There's also a large uh, uh, instances which WHO did a study about of abandonment of assistive technology. That means that, in fact, people have access to, say, aids such as cane or like, you know, smart wheelchairs, but they don't fit them, right? They're not customized and hence they are abandoned. Uh, so how can we uh, create, say, effective financing mechanisms so that we empower persons with disability to get access to the right assistive aids? Uh, I think overall, uh, uh, 
another question is of that of distribution, of course, uh, uh, which sort of comes, which is a subset of the whole affordability, uh, you know, philanthropy bit. Uh, but overall, I think uh, uh, it's the question of the mindset. Disability is seen as something which is which happens to other people or which happens by chance, and it's an unfortunate thing. Uh, we must understand that at any point in time, all of us might experience disability in some shape or form. It may be temporary. Uh, we have a large geriatric population who experience disability in some shape or form. So I think the biggest challenge uh, where startups can make a difference is where the entire mind shift from uh, disability to, you know, in, in make it making it an integral part of healthcare uh, make it more high functional uh, make it aiding people with disabilities rather than being charitable to them uh, that's what i would say um yeah christopher this wants is, to jump in yeah this is christopher i i, I wanted i'm triggering on something that you said about multifunction um, it's, it's interesting to me that you mentioned two pieces of abandoned technology the, 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 the chair the smart chair and the smart cane but it, uh, that reminds me that the old expression, the best camera you have is the one you have in your pocket. So the idea of, of taking something that people already have and expanding the uses of it, that feels like it's a really interesting space to go. So there's no supply chain you need to build. So digital accessibility or the integration of digital into built environments is, is, is really powerful because no one's gonna give up their cell phone. So you have this, please. Um, no, uh, I was just agreeing with you, Chris. Yeah, I think that is a great opportunity for innovators to step in because, and also uh, I think a signal for us to invest in that R&D uh, uh, and encouraging innovators in this space from very early on, right from schools, colleges. A lot of us, I mean, we've been advocating for disability curriculums to be included in schools uh, for, uh, at a very, very young age. Yeah. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you uh, also for jumping in already and making the discussion more lively. I think um, uh, you approached the topic, um, Ankita, from, from an interesting perspective, from the perspective of, uh, you know, mindsets, entrepreneurial spirit, from maybe tools and techniques uh, that the, and tactics that the uh, um, corporate or, or impact entrepreneurship uh, community has developed over time. Um, so I think that that's a very interesting reflections on how uh, your work can contribute to the field um, and to the issue. Um, I would like to continue with the opinions of some other panelists. Um, it can be, you know, your responses can go in such a direction, but I would also be keen to hear maybe uh, are there any particular sectors or really hands-on challenges where you think um, impact entrepreneurs would be best positioned to invent or co-create solutions there. Um, so who would like to go next? Uh, there's, sorry? There's a hand, but you can't see it. Oh my God, no, I can't see it. Where? Oh, I can, uh, oh, that's me. Uh, please go ahead, just jump in, Chiru. Um, it's fine, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, from a sector's perspective, there's, you know, obviously it's across the board that there is, uh, there is value of, of this perspective. But I think the two sectors that really, I think, jump out is one, you look at education and the other, when you look at mobility, especially, or rather broadly, the urban space. Uh, for two more recent things, right, the, the inclusion of digital uh, within education and our acceptance of it as a medium, uh, it, it's kind of almost opened up the space and saying if you were if you were designing by thinking of uh, of disability as one of the criteria, you would actually improve the service across the board, uh, right? In terms of even basic things, right? Um, uh, like the transcription point that you were making, it was made it was thought of as somebody who was able bodied. Uh, so education and because of its <clears throat> now very digital linking has a lot of potential in you know in trying to think of it because almost all of us have had that moment where we were looking at a screen and we couldn't see it correctly right and that, that was a temporary disability that all of us experienced uh, 
Um, and if you can almost take that lens, then there's, I think, immense potential within education uh, to, to think of products. And I think by, by placing it in the bigger market, that the, the challenge of scale, right, like Ankita was mentioning, is, is sometimes kind of tries to solve for itself uh, because it's a product that might reach might be designed for a core audience, but might be equally valuable for a larger audience. Um, I think similarly within um, urban, mobility is actually a really interesting space. Uh, right? And we are kind of seeing mobility change in, uh, you know, from its very traditional view of you have a car and uh, we have public transport to people thinking about shared, people thinking about very nuances of how people would pay for it, how will you read something. Um, and I think again, uh, it's a, the, I mean, cities at the base of it are where everybody comes to contribute. And therefore, if you make the barriers to contribution lower, it will help across the board. And urbanization is going to be one of the, the, the mega trends that the globe is going to see. Um, and therefore, as, as an area of innovation, that space is going to uh, almost the similar logic as education, right? Like whatever we innovate here will help, uh, will have population level impact. So in my opinion, I think those spaces would be very interesting, but um, across the board, right? Like uh, whether it's agri-tech or health, I don't think you can say any sector is excluded. Uh, thank you, Charu, for outlining two of the sectors where you see great potential. And um, as well, Ankita, you've mentioned before the mainstreaming aspect um, of the opportunity and the challenge ahead. Mira would like to contribute. Yes, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest need in, in this disability sector is you need evangelists who will keep talking about the disability agenda to mainstream it among the impact investors and the other spaces. Yesterday, I was a panelist at a, a new, very interesting center which has been set up by a person from Carnegie Mellon, uh, which is the use of AI in society. And there I found that the entire audience, all the panelists just had not thought about disability, you know, as an agenda point at all. The main areas in which they work are health, education, livelihoods. All three areas, extremely important for youth and persons with disabilities. But nowhere was disability on their radar at all. And when I spoke there, uh, it was simply amazing, you know. Uh, immediately they realized that this is such an important, with ESG coming, disability is going to be on everyone's radar. You cannot ignore it anymore. Uh, so I think we really need evangelists keep talking about mainstreaming this in the existing ecosphere. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic topic. I'm happy to expand on that. Christopher wants to jump in. Yes, this, this awareness is a significant problem, and it, it is everywhere in the world. Awareness of disability, awareness of accessibility options has, has been a challenge. I, I want to give our friends at Microsoft a huge shout out for what they did with the Xbox adaptive controller and the, the following Super Bowl commercial afterwards. I th I've, I've seen a visceral change in, 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 in business contacts and business conversations around accessibility and disability inclusion since then. So I think we have actually started to gain some momentum, but we, we need that next XAC. We need that next really powerful innovation that keeps the conversation moving forward. And to your point, you know, I, think, I think AI really is where these things can, be, can, can happen. You take a look at advances in, in speech recognition. There's some magical things happening there in terms of, of captioning and translation. What's next? Um, with, with computer vision opportunities, the really interesting things that can happen in terms of text recognition in the real world. So for me, this, this awareness is, is a real problem and it limits innovation because people don't know there's a problem there. So I, I completely agree. Without people knowing there's a problem, we're never going to find a solution. So we either need to have us scream louder or find people who, who can be partnered with us and, and can start talking about this with us broadening the choir to say. Uh, thank you, Christopher. And I think um, your presence here um, is, a is a demonstration of, 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 of 
of importance as well as looking at it from what Mira brought up, um, that the whole impact investment sector as such, though it's focusing on impact and not comes from a traditional corporate perspective, um, is, has not yet the topic of disability on its agenda. I was myself totally astonished when I started to engage with the disability movement six, seven years back, how underfunded the area is uh, from a philanthropic perspective. Um, and that's just from a philanthropic perspective. Uh, and when we look at the impact um, or the social entrepreneurship movement globally, we see that it's not yet, as you said, Mira, on the top of the agendas. Um, so I think one, one of the things where we can collaborate together um, with Omidia, with Social Alpha, with other intermediaries, with the impact investment community that is growing and trying to find new ways also to finance capitalism, um, that we just put this on the top of the agenda and th that we work together to kind of integrate this in what is already emerging, just from a perspective of the, of the, of the, uh, of the ecosystem of support that we need to shift, I think, uh, and put a lens on, on our work here. Um, I see there is a question from the audience, yes, right? And I'm happy to take it and, um, and integrate it, so please Thanks a lot. So my name is Gabriella. I'm a cybersecurity expert for social engineering. And I have a question, is there in India's young companies or people who work or universities who work in analyzing the algorithms of, for example, TikTok, Instagram, and that way to send out messages, learning messages, to include better all the handicapped subjects into education because a lot of young people, they watch Instagram, they are on TikTok, so it would be world, worthwhile to reflect how to use uh, the algorithms, because I know uh, quite some young people triggered out how algorithms work and that way have high amounts of followers. Thanks. Who would like to take that? Any response from, from the panelists? Uh, yeah, true. So, um, so at Omedea we have a uh, at Omidya, we have a, a, a significantly large practice in digital society, and um, and there are numerous organizations that actually work on this bit, uh, especially trying to see how they're working, what is behind some of this technology. But I think, as Mira very eloquently put it, a lot of it does not actually talk about disability or talk about a very specific user group. And only recently, we've you know. Uh, I think inclusion has many, many meanings and a lot of the discussion in India is, you know, we're still almost grappling with the idea of how does it work for a child versus an adult, a female versus a male. Um, and, and therefore the nuance isn't, and I think it would be, so there isn't, a, I think, a dearth of organizations looking at technology and trying to ask some of these questions, but are they asking it in a way that it might be reflective of what is needed by the community or what is needed by the users. Uh, very early, very, very little work uh, actually happening in the digital space. Quite su surprisingly, the leaders are, uh, and Ankita might know this, but the likes of Google and Facebook are, are very big when it comes to um, actually working with even the developer community uh, on issues of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, versus actually the startup or the, the non-profit space. The non-profit space has actually stayed in more of the traditional uh, area. But would love to know more from uh, Mira about it. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say, yes, uh, I don't think there's any university who's doing the kind of work which you mentioned. But on the other hand, uh, organizations like ours who are progressive and large in the disability space have started looking at academias on how do you um, actually partner with them. And one interesting, since you mentioned AI, is that uh, we've partnered with IIT Hyderabad. IIT is our uh, premier institutes, if you call it, uh, where they are doing the AI algorithms for us. And we are setting up uh, uh, AI-triggered accessible job platform for youth with disabilities. So um, that's, we find an extremely fascinating space to be in because they give us the cutting edge technology. You know, we bring the disability uh, 
deep understanding. And uh, then we have the prime minister's scientific officer, which gives us other resources, not financial. Financial, we have a big bank, which is funding us. So I think when these different players come together, you know, and work with education, in fact, all our next work is going to be such partnerships. Because what I realize is that the space of disability is, everyone says, you know, it's underfunded, job says, you know, there are so many issues. So how do you bring it? You can only bring it to limelight and give sustainable solutions. I think if you bring the best of the partnerships together, and I think that's the way ahead. This is Christopher. I think this is an interesting question in terms of understanding algorithms, but I'd like to add one other sort of wrinkle into the problem is, is access to data. I mean, uh, we, earlier we, we heard about the, 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 we have a challenge of access to users. So with any kind of machine learning, machine learning algorithm, you need to have access to ample data to be able to train the model. So there's the, the, the general concern of, 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 of these algorithms, like, like TikTok, I don't want to name any companies, but these, these kinds of algorithms on, human, on just general humanity, and right. then there's the, the, the dimension of disability on top of that. So getting enough data of people with disabilities and the impact of them, of, of these algorithms, that's an even harder thing to, 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 to find because the access to the users makes it hard for us to get data. Without the data, we can't actually do the research to understand the, the impact. So we have, this is an important thing to do, but I don't see any easy answer. Yeah, thank you. And it's definitely one of the challenges that we have in that ecosystem, that there is insufficient amount of data out there that can serve as fuel to develop solutions. I would like to shift briefly the, our discussion a bit. Um, I would love to have a bit the perspective of the social entrepreneur now uh, in our circle. So um, uh, I would like to ask you first, Mira, and then, then open to the others. Um, when you are you know, an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur, an impact entrepreneur, and you want to start up uh, and have an idea, and you want to start up, develop the idea, and bring it to the market to create impact, specifically in the field of disability. What are barriers that you encounter out there? And there is another mm -hmm. question I would like to attach to it, because I think uh, we also see worldwide uh, disabled-led enterprise development movement. So people with disabilities themselves starting up, uh, enterprises and getting engaged as impact entrepreneurs and so forth. Um, so I, I would love to have both perspectives, if possible, or choose one of them. Um, what are the barriers for entrepreneurs to start up uh, in India? I think the barriers are the same whether you're a for-profit or a non-for-profit organization. <clears throat> you always, people struggle for angel fund if you're not a known person, um, you, uh, you're bootstrapped for getting good human resources because you can't pay for them. Um, you want to make the right kind of partnerships, but you don't perhaps get them. Um, so I think the, uh, the, and if it's the disability space, which people don't understand, and there are no proven models, especially for example, when I started I can tell you, George, I only got, we decided not to take any funds because we did not want to be uh, pushed into a corner to do the kind of work which, you know, a funder may uh, actually do. So for one year, we really struggled till we got our tax exemptions in place. And after that, there was no looking back because uh, we had, you know, good funders coming. But having said that, I think that if you're transparent, if you're obsessive about scale and you're passionate about work, um, in India, I can say because of our company, CSR Act, there really is no dearth for funds, even in the disability space. Uh, the interesting thing is that, yes, there are very interesting models of, in fact, even I have some friends who are persons with disabilities themselves and coming out with very innovative social enterprises, which I really feel will, you know, uh, create waves in the future, because um, there's very refreshing ways of thinking. 
Um, thank you, Miro, for opening that. And um, I have to confess, since I started to engage in the sector 20 years back, I was always inspired by the Indian uh, impact and social entrepreneurship movement. And I think we all around the world took a lot of inspiration and copied quite a lot of your practices uh, along the way. And I'm wondering, Ankita and Charu, from an ecosystem actors and supporters perspective, can you give us maybe one or two examples how you help to overcome barriers for the impact entrepreneurs that you work with? Um, I can go first. Um, thanks. Um, I think uh, we very early realized that uh, the issues faced by social entrepreneurs in India, especially in the assistive technology space, are because of a lack of an ecosystem uh, uh, for them to rely on. Uh, of course, funding was a bit of a challenge. We didn't see any commercial investors investing in the disability space actively. But I think there are a couple of reasons because of that. Uh, there is no distribution system which is uh, uh, which is systematic. We don't have hub spots for distribution. Training programs don't exist uh, for fitment. There are no after sales or repair services that exist. The entire ecosystem is missing and a lot of it is uh, there, uh, you know, uh, in bits and pieces everywhere. Uh, and the second thing that we realized is there's a lot of pressure on the social entrepreneur to make an assistive technology device extremely affordable, extremely affordable, which this means that they have to use the best technology and price it in a way that, uh, uh, you know, everybody in some sense can afford it. Uh, we also realized that uh, they got limited feedback from uh, from the users themselves. So a lot of the entrepreneurs that we worked with have personal stories. They saw a friend uh, uh, who met with an accident, and then uh, you know they created this crutch, uh, which sort of imit uh, the bottom of whose uh, imitates the human leg. Uh, the crutch uh, significantly reduces the effort on the part of the user and uh, is a great uh, help to anybody who's been using crutches for a long period of time. A lot of these are personal stories. We work with another entrepreneur who's uh, physically disabled himself, has uh, created a matching platform for assistance uh, to take users, uh, uh, you know, out for hospital visits, uh, any kind of visits outside, so outdoor mobility assistance on demand. Uh, so we've seen all these uh, lovely personal stories, but uh, I think the fact remains that there is no systematic way in which social entrepreneurs can, uh, you know, uh, uh, reach out to users for formal impact, uh, for formal feedback. Uh, so what we've done is we've created uh, an ecosystem around this, a bunch of mentors. We've worked with the government uh, to create labs, uh, which our startups can ac access to. Uh, we've also created mentors in this space to help startups go through their regulatory pathways, get the right certifications. We've also created an end financing program, which sort of uh, which is a assistive technology market access fund. We call it Atma, and it subsidizes uh, the user's cost by 50%. So give me, let me give you an example here. We saw that a lot of people wouldn't buy premium crutches because the crutches that are available, uh, it, you know, there are lots of crutches available for free and are distributed by a lot of philanthropists. Uh, we could not get users to try crutches which were more efficient, would make their life easier mm -hmm. for anything. Uh, we, we couldn't tell the entrepreneur to give them out for free because we want this to become a business. So what we created is we worked with emphasis to create a, uh, and sit be right now, uh, to create a market access fund. Uh, what this helps the entrepreneur is to give a 50% discount to the users to help them just buy the product for the first time and get them to try their product. The hope is that once the user has tried a premium quality product and has experienced the changes that has brought into their lives, they will continue to buy that product. 
so we've created a few financing mechanisms as well. And we've seen some great results. So in this way, we've tried to plug in, uh, you know, various uh, gaps that we've seen uh, startup space uh, in their journey from idea to market. Uh, thank you, Ankita, for these really uh, great in-depth examples as well. Um, and Charu, would you like to add something? Sure. So I think, uh, like I said, we're kind of slightly early on the journey of specifically looking at this sector, but I think um, as, as an investor in Impact and having supported both nonprofits and for-profits, uh, a lot of our uh, support has been actually on, on helping the entrepreneur kind of run their business better. Uh, so every, you know, so various kinds of support programs from uh, how do you even think of an organization uh, to how do you think of your, how do you communicate your impact? Uh, and so I think a very interesting example of somebody who leads a think tank was I didn't even realize that, you know, I and CEO are two different entities and these are two different jobs. Uh, because like Ankita said, a lot of things, uh, entities are run on passion and then uh, converting that passion into an organization is just a journey in itself. Uh, and that that's really, I think, where, you know, we've focused our support on. Uh, because at the end of the day, the, you know, there are these, if you want them to grow, uh, the impact only grows when the organization grows, right? And the organization needs the right structure, it needs the right funding. Um, and that's really where most of our, our focus has been. Uh, and, and sometimes just being able to measure and communicate, right? How do you even measure? So finding that agency that can think about what does impact for this particular entity mean? How should they measure? How do sh how should they do? How should they use what they get from that as part of their own business? Uh, so I think really kind of focusing on that journey of this great person with a great idea. How do they? How do we help them build that organization? And what does that organization need to grow its impact? Uh, great. Great, thank you, Charu. Um, I, I would like to move now our discussion to the aspect of collaboration, and I will turn to Christoph in a second, but I would also like to ask the audience, if you already have some burning questions that you would like to ask, please start to raise your hands. I will take you on, uh, because I see we only have, I think, 15 minutes left. Um, but I would um, now, you know, ask Christopher. Um, we have heard, I think, throughout the discussions the power of collaboration. I heard before, you know, the term collective knowledge. Uh, you know, I was before in the hackathon session. You know, we start to, I think, set up processes and, and develop a culture of collaboration that is open, that is, creates labs, um, and wants to channel our collective wisdom into creating solutions. So from your perspective at Google, uh, I'm wondering, specifically when it comes to the collaboration with impact uh, startups. Um, how, how do you see that? What are the you know, opportunities for Google? You mentioned this great example as well before, um, which is, was awesome. And I was wondering, you know, how did this young person actually come to talk to Google? Uh, because very often the, is the, the master challenge to start collaborations with a large entity and that must not be only a corporation, but it can be a large international NGO that is everywhere, is whom do I talk to? Which telephone number? Uh, how do I reach the right person? Um, so I would love to ask you, how do you see this? Is this? Does it require or do we have a more structured approach to work with impact startups? And what's the power of collaboration for you here? I, th I think the power of collaboration is, the collaboration is sort of the grease that makes everything go. Because no one organization has all of the skills, all of the awareness, all of the talent to be able to do everything. So the only way we can do these things is by doing them together. In this specific instance, when it came to transcribe glass, to, to meet his point, it's who you know. This person's dad happened to know somebody who worked at Google who knew me. So through the, the, the telephone chain, it, and please don't call me, but the, 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 the telephone game, it, it, the email was passed from person to person to person, it, it came to me, and it was interesting. So I, I reached out and said, hey, I'd like to hear what you're doing. So that doesn't scale. So that's, that's the problem with this model of who you know is that it doesn't scale. So then the next thing we, we take a look at is sort of the, the, the balance of disability-owned startups and disability-focused startups. If you work with a company that is, that is sort of DEI focused, they, they talk about representation because it's easy to measure representation. But then how you define disability is, it begins, it gets, then it starts to get gray. 
because it's the obvious kind, it's the for people who are blind or deaf or in a chair, but what, happened, what about neuro, neurodiversity or depression or migraines? These things also change the way you, you view the world and how you would try to accomplish these things. So even through a DEI lens, who to partner with, who, who counts as disabled is, is an interesting question. And then when you come to the, the, the disability-focused business, then the question is, how do you have impact? And then it's just the same question that everybody in, in, in this room has, is who is the right answer? What is the right answer? Who is the right person to partner with? Where is the, the least amount of risk or the most amount of potential? Whether you're Google or, or an accelerator or a startup, these are, these are the same questions. Now, we may have a little more, more ability to, to take risk because we have more money. And we, we have a history of doing this kind of thing, and this is something that I hope that we can do again in the, in the future, because the only way, as I said when we started, the only way to really build everything for everyone is to have everyone build together. Uh, thank you, Christopher. And I, I would love to turn the question to the colleagues from India online, um, also from a perspective that, and I think you have it a lot, in your work that you, you have done yourselves, uh, you know that there is this emerging insights and emerging approach of collective impact uh, in our movement. So we start, or even funders and supporters start to understand that maybe only supporting individual social entrepreneurs from that spirit that you also just mentioned, Christoph, it's not going to you know, get us to the end game. Um, it's, a great approach, it's nice, but it probably will not solve the big challenges that we have ahead of us. So we, we increasingly see collectives of social entrepreneurs joining forces by enlightened funders supporting more system-changing journeys um, of a collective of partners that even you know, comprise not just social entrepreneurs, but corporations, government, institutions. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, you know, how this new culture of collective impact is unfolding in India. Um, and I think you also have experience around COVID-19 and, uh, you know, crisis uh, and, um, you know, the new approaches that we develop worldwide, I think, to counterbalance uh, the damages that were done through collective impact. So I'm really happy to hear from you. It's, I think, my last round of questions to you. We didn't have, I think, in the audience another question. Sorry that I monopolized. Um, I will then hand it over to Mira uh, to wrap us up. So, Cheru or um, Ankita, would you like to respond? So, I think uh, second the idea on a collective, and I. I would say one of the reasons we are here is because we are trying to partner with Mira and try to see what we can do together. Uh, and also, I think more so, uh, collectives work, it's not just about, I think, collective impact. It's also, I think, bringing together expertise. Uh, assuming each one of us would build all the muscle is it's hard, right? I think it's easier to build that muscle of partnering. Uh, so completely second that, I think the I think the bigger opportunity over there is just also how we make that voice diverse enough. I think the uh, co collectives have the same challenge as partnerships. You can only call the person you know. Um, so I, I, I don't have an answer to this, but I think uh, it's a question of how do we make sure we have enough voices within the collective and the collective is not an eco chamber. Okay, um, Ankita, would you like to contribute? Yeah. No, I absolutely echo Charles Sex sentiment. I mean, we are all, uh, 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 we all know what we do really well, uh, but but there's so much work out there uh, that uh, we need help with, uh, especially uh, in our experience working with the government uh, or with academics uh, uh, has been has been very, very fulfilling. And I think we did not start from there, given our traditional agenda of supporting social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we very quickly realized that this will only go forward if we make it into a collective effort. Uh, so be it uh, 
our financing program or be it uh, access to law program or be it any approvals for regulatory or feedback from the users. I think we've tried to sort of collaborate with the government, uh, with uh, academics, uh, with multilaterals, because I think uh, uh, we, we want to minimize the chances of getting this wrong. We, we want to uh, sort of give us, uh, we want to cover all bases, and I think we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we have support, uh, uh, I mean, thanks to, uh, you know, everybody is just a Zoom call away. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I think collaboration definitely is something that we need to design into the pro any program that we do from the beginning and not something as a reaction. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And um, what you just uh, said reminded me on a nice saying that says that um, the ecosystem, the two most important ingredients are people and a culture of trust and collaboration. And I think from our discussion today, we really see that there is also a new culture of collaboration emerging with a lot of opportunities attached. And I would like to thank you a lot for this very interesting discussion and hand over to Mira to wrap this up and close the session as the chair. Thank you. I think we have exactly about three minutes, George, left. So uh, I think yours were beautiful words and it was a wonderful question also to wrap the session up on you know collective action the fact that we can't anymore work in silos covid has shown so much uncertainty in everyone's life and i think each one of us realizes that unless we put our collective strengths together uh, especially in vulnerable areas like disability you will not be able to move fast to get sustained solutions. I think it's been a wonderful discussion having Ankita, Charu, Christopher, and you, and Sumi, who, who's been supporting us in all these sessions. Um, I'm sure we'll all, our paths will cross again. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> My turn shows five.